very good. All right. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, starting your business, but it's not a one, two, three um, um, list of what you need to do to accomplish it. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about um, the things you need to think about as you get your business going and the things you need to address in your planning process. Uh, I am uh, a member of SCORE in Western Massachusetts. Um, uh, SCORE uh, is the largest uh, organization in the United States of uh, um, proficient and e uh, expert mentors. Uh, our volunteers who are mentors are successful and experienced business people. Uh, SCORE's mission uh, is to uh, provide education and mentoring. Uh, education we cover through seminars and workshops and um, um, mentoring, uh, we do it one-on-one, -on -one. we do it uh, through email, and we do it through uh, video. Currently, uh, we're coming out of the 100% video uh, based on COVID, and we are starting to do some one-on-one uh, -on -one face to face Now, there are all of the resources that you can find. Uh, you'll be able to find them on uh, score.org. Um, now, um, uh, Teresa is going to uh, release a poll that I need you to answer um, uh, to ask you about uh, what, how you're planning on starting your business there. So if you would, uh, go ahead and um, answer that poll. When, you, um, uh, when you're ready to get your SCORE mentor, we have chapters in uh, Worcester, uh, Western Massachusetts, which is uh, Springfield, Southeast Massachusetts, southeast of, uh, uh, of Boston, Northeast Massachusetts, northeast of Boston, Boston, Cape Cod, and uh, Rhode Island. And um, uh, if you're in a specific area, you want to touch one of these folks, uh, go to their website, you'll find a mentor uh, um, button on there. Go ahead and click the mentor. Okay, how are we looking? Um, looks like 91% uh, of, uh, of you are planning on starting a business from scratch. Uh, a few of you are uh, looking at starting a home-based business. Uh, one of you wants to start a nonprofit. Uh, and uh, three of you are planning on starting an online business. Uh, we'll take that as an indicator. Other folks that come in will probably fit the, uh, the same profile. Okay, uh, I think we can stop the poll now. And let's move on. Uh, share results. Yeah, you can just uh, X that window for the poll and it should go away for it. Okay, like I said, learning curve here. Um, all right. Let's go. Okay, startup basics. Are you ready to start this business? Okay, you've, you've all have, have been thinking about this business for years, maybe, and uh, now it's time to say, I'm, I'm going to try to do it now. What, you, what we're going to talk about in this workshop, we're going to be talking about what good is coming out of the workshop. What are you, what are you uh, going to gain from this? The myths and realities of entrepreneurship. Some people go into uh, uh, into starting their business with some preconceived notions about um, the greatness or the, the, the pitfalls of a business. We're going to talk about those for a second. Critical success factors, things that are very important to make sure that you don't fail in your business. Uh, knowing about your options of how to start your business. Uh, the components of business ownership. What, it's more than just putting up a sign and opening the, opening the front door, uh, virtual or, uh, or in reality. Uh, there's a lot more involved in that. What, do, what have you got to think about there? Making it legal. What are your options from a legal standpoint, uh, structure, et cetera? And then uh, we're going to talk about business plan basics, and I'm going to explain why we need to talk about that. Uh, and we're asking you to do a uh, self-assessment uh, before you get onto your, uh, onto your next steps. So the first thing we're going to cover is this idea of uh, myths. Uh, things that people generally assume. Uh, number one, as an entrepreneur, you don't have to work that hard or put in such long hours. Some of you are already dabbling in the uh, in the business that you want to start. You've already discovered that there's a lot more work to it than uh, than having a nine to five job or uh, working in a factory or a retail outlet or something like that. 
as an owner, as an entrepreneur, you have to work a lot harder than, uh, than just reporting and clicking the time clock. Uh, my product or service is unique and there's no competition. Uh, not necessarily true. Um, the competition that you have may not be uh, exactly your product, but we're talking about competition for solving the problem that the customer is bringing to the table here. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, myth number three, business owners can deduct everything so you don't have to pay taxes. Well, that's not necessarily true either. You need to work with, a, uh, with an accountant to maybe set up your QuickBooks and so forth. And uh, all of your personal uh, finances need to be completely separated from your uh, business endeavors. So we're talking about a separate checking account. We're talking about uh, separate accounting. Uh, everything is in its nice little compartments. Uh, so things like your rent, light, and heat for your home uh, are not included in what you're possible uh, to deduct. I, I'm thinking about a, a company I know of that um, uh, has their business and one of the individuals has a, a, a mother that needs some, um, some caretaking. So they decided to put the, uh, the mother's caretaker on the uh, business payroll. Well, it doesn't work because it's not relative to the business that you're, that you're working with. You have to keep those two separated. As a business owner, you won't have a boss. Guess what? Every single one of your customers is your boss. So now you're multiplying uh, the number of bosses the people that demand you to finish the job that you promise. Uh, so uh, it's a little, more, uh, a little more complicated than just having one boss. And uh, number five, business owners get to do whatever they want to do. Uh, if you're running a, uh, uh, let's say a Burger King and, and the cleaning staff doesn't show up for the day, um, you're the one responsible for cleaning the toilets and making sure they all get done. So you have a lot more responsibilities, not just being the boss. You got to make sure everything uh, works according to plan. Uh, the reality here is that 24% uh, of all new businesses uh, fail within the first two years. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> uh, and then after five years, Half of all new businesses fail. Uh, it's very important to understand the four main reasons why a small business fails. The first, the first reason for failure, the most primary uh, reason for failure is lack of planning. In other words, you go into this thing, you open the door, you don't know exactly who your suppliers are, you don't know uh, um, uh, how many employees you're going to need, uh, uh, all of the, the, the small details of running your business, you haven't set up a plan for that. The second, and you're going to keep hearing this today, is insufficient capitalization when you start up. You need to be sure you have enough money to keep the, uh, the business going. Uh, so if the business uh, doesn't start contributing uh, income to you, uh, you're going to have to find it somewhere else. Uh, and that may mean that, uh, that you have to borrow some money up front and we'll talk about that um, as we go forward. And then mismanagement of cash flow. Okay, people look at their income statement at the bottom line, they see this line, it says profit. And they think, well, I, that's all money I can spend. Um, when it comes to managing your cash, number one, profit is not cash. Uh, we look at the bank account and uh, we have a couple of things. We have to make sure that we're paying all the current bills for sure but I have to be sure that I'm gonna have enough money in there to make the payroll for next month. Um, uh, three months down the road, I'm planning on uh, buying a new uh, computer. Uh, I have to have enough money uh, set aside to be able to do those kind of things. So you gotta manage your cash, hold on to it as long as you can and um, um, uh, spend it according to the plan that you've developed. And the last thing, the number four item, on here, uh, the most of the four most common reasons businesses fail is pricing. Um, pricing is a whole art, and we have a workshop uh, which we haven't scheduled yet. Scheduled yet about pricing, how to set your prices, 
There are a number of different ways to look at that. And we can discuss that as we go forward. But primarily, you always have to sell above your cost. I mean, it seems like a logical thing, but then we come to the def definition of the word cost. What's involved in the cost? It's not just the, um, the, um, the cup that you put in the, in the package, it's the packaging itself, it's the advertising that made you aware of my cup, it's the rent, light, and heat of the shop that uh, stores the cup for you to come in and see it, it's the staff I have to put behind the counter so you can buy the cup. So capturing what is the real cost of delivering that product to the customer, very important. And then you have to set your price so your price is higher uh, than, the, uh, than the cost. You can, should never sell it at un, uh, less than cost. So those are the four, uh, the four main items. Oops, sorry about that. Um, lack of planning insufficient capital, mismanagement of, of your cash, and improper pricing. Those are the four main, uh, main problems. The planning part is a specialty of SCORE. Uh, one of our main products is helping you develop your business plan at the beginning of your business uh, for a couple of reasons. Most people think business plans are just for the, uh, uh, for the banks or the lender. Uh, it works for that for sure. But the most important part of business planning is for you to manage your business. And we'll talk about that in future sessions. Okay, do you have what it takes? These are the critical success factors that, um, that you need to be uh, cognizant of. Uh, first, you, do you have the education or experience to, um, to start this business? I had uh, a client who came to me, wanted to start a restaurant. I asked them, what's your, uh, what's your experience? What's, what's, uh, how, do, how do you know how to run a restaurant? He said, I eat out every single night. I know exactly how restaurants should operate. Well, you're uh, talking about the front end maybe, but in the back end, all that stuff about hiring the employees and uh, making sure the, the meals are good and you qualify, uh, the, su the supply chain, uh, your pricing, your marketing, the whole nine yards, uh, uh, that's another realm of, uh, of experience that this individual did not have. A critical success factor, you need to have a strong work ethic that says, if I don't feel very good this morning, I still have to go in and open up because my commitment to my customer is that I'm going to be open at 6 a.m. with a product for them to, to purchase. Uh, so you have to have a strong work ethic. Uh, effective time management. This says that you know when everything needs to be done, but you need to reserve time for, let's say, checking your email, uh, reserve time for that uh, employee meeting at the beginning of the day. Uh, you need to uh, understand that um, uh, this thing that's on your desk, this task that needs to be done, do I need to do it right now or can I delay it or can I delegate it and have somebody else do it? You need to be able to manage your time. And there are courses and, um, and uh, seminars on effective time management. If you feel like you're too disorganized, uh, perhaps uh, taking one of those uh, uh, webinars or workshops would be uh, useful to you. Uh, and then uh, can you do more than one thing at a time? Uh, unfortunately in business, your problems don't line up one, two, three, four, and uh, they come at you all at once. So you have to be able to deal with the customer, answer the telephone, uh, uh, manage your employees, uh, talk to the supplier about the delivery schedule and so forth. And you need to be able to uh, do all this stuff kind of at the same time. How do you manage that? Uh, can I call uh, another employee? Can I delay the, uh, the response? Hey, I'll call you back in 10 minutes, uh, that kind of thing. How, you, how can you manage uh, multitasking? Okay. You have to be able to do that. Uh, and um, willingness to ask for help and take advice from others. Uh, you're demonstrating your interest in doing that uh, by actually attending this workshop. You're, um, uh, you're here to learn something uh, and hopefully we, uh, we help you with that. Um, and if you decide that you're gonna get a, a SCORE mentor, somebody to help you with your planning and uh, work through these issues that we, uh, that we talk about, uh, that's another, uh, another thing uh, that can help you uh, towards your success. So 
willingness to ask for help is really critical. Um, be open to, uh, to asking other folks uh, how to operate it. And again, we come back to the topic of adequate capital. The, uh, when you go to borrow money, uh, let's say you borrow uh, a loan that's guaranteed by the SBA, the SBA will allow you to, uh, to borrow three months of working capital, which is basically the expenses you need to pay for three months. Uh, you should have that capital, whether you borrow it uh, or pull it out of your savings or get it from your mother or whatever. Uh, you need to be sure you have enough money in the beginning. You come to me with your business plan. I'm a banker. And you say, I need $30,000 to start my business. So we go through the process. I give you the $30,000. You're back in business. Um, two months later, you come to me and say, well, I, you know, I underestimated how much it was going to cost me for uh, uh, for my delivery service. I need to borrow another $5,000. As a banker, looking at what you're saying, if you are not strong enough in your estimate the first time around, what makes me think that your second guess of, uh, of $5,000 is going to be any more accurate than the first one you did? I'm, are you coming back to me in another three months? Uh, your credibility is shot uh, if you don't guess right in the beginning. So we want to make sure that through your planning process, you develop how much capital I actually need to have as I start this business. And we have some tools that can help you with that. We've got templates for um, sales and cost projections um, that can help you make a, a more accurate guess. Uh, and your SCORE mentor can uh, lead you to that uh, as well. Uh, startup cost. Um, uh, essential considerations. These are things that you're going to have to pay for before you open the doors. Okay. Tools and equipment. Depending on what job you're doing, your tool may be a, a, a hammer and chisel, or it could be the um, uh, it could be the computer that you're going to use. Uh, that kind of thing. Leasehold improvements. Uh, this says whatever space you're going to go into, you need to fix it up so it fits what your business is going to do. If you're doing a homebound business, and a couple of you uh, indicated that, if you're doing a business from home, it means that the space that you're working in needs to be configured, uh, designed to, uh, to support your, your business functions. That may mean that you need to put in extra lights, you might want to put carpeting down, uh, that sort of thing. Um, if you're picking up a storefront somewhere, you might want to paint the walls, um, put in a, a countertop, add a bookshelf, uh, whatever. Uh, so you need to fix up the space that you're working in. And then what licenses or permits do you need to operate your business, both professionally and uh, from the standpoint of the city or town that you're located in? Uh, depending on the type of business you have, there may you may need to apply for a permit in order to do that. Uh, professional fees. Uh, if you belong to a professional organization, uh, there are probably fees involved for continued uh, accreditation with that, uh, with that function, whether it's a lawyer, an accountant, uh, a photographer, uh, whatever. Sometimes those organizations, most of the time, those organizations have uh, professional fees that you're going to have to uh, pay. And then initial inventory. Um, uh, if you're selling something, either tangible or intangible, that must be delivered to the, to the client you have to have that inventory on hand before you open the door. If you're selling books, I expect you to have an inventory of books uh, that I can uh, browse through on the first day when you pop that door open. If, you sell, if you're a restaurant, you need to have enough food uh, in your inventory to be able to uh, present the lunches or meals for that uh, day, week, or month. Okay. And then again, one more time, Working capital reserve fund. You need to have some money uh, set aside for the things that you did not anticipate. The, uh, the freezer breaks. I got to buy a new freezer. Um, where are you getting the money from? Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're working off uh, just uh, cash flow, you may not have enough money to, to put a new freezer in there. So you need a good working capital reserve fund. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, uh, before you get into this, before you get into starting your business, um, and before you sit down with that, uh, that banker, that investor, uh, your mother, uh, you need to look at 
uh, how, what's your personal financial situation? What is your total monthly cost of living? Because if you're abandoning a job and going into entrepreneurship, you still have to pay your, your uh, monthly uh, bills and expenses, your rent, light and heat, mortgage, whatever. Um, so what is that? What's that number? We need to be, you need to be aware of that. Uh, and then look at areas where you can cut back. You need to have as much flexibility as possible going into this, uh, into this business. You need to make sure that you're, um, you're uh, uh, strong uh, in the area of, uh, uh, of those expenses um, to figure out what you can cut back. Uh, can you eliminate some of those cable channels that you're paying for? Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, what is your outstanding debt? When you talk to the, uh, when you talk to the bank, they're going to ask you for your how much debt you have, and they're going to go compare that to the amount of income that you have. So we need to understand what that is, um, and you'll be looking at interest rates and that sort of thing. What things can I consolidate? Um, what things could I maybe pay off? Uh, whatever, but you need to know uh, the details of your outstanding debt. And how much money do you have in savings? Uh, savings uh, has two, uh, two functions. The first function is to uh, tell me how much you got in there, what's the volume in your savings uh, that you could bring to the table, uh, either as an uh, investment in your business or as a, a safety net. Uh, the other thing to say, having a savings account is, it, it demonstrates that you're conscious of, uh, of uh, and reliable with your money. So uh, I'm planning for the future in my savings account, whether it's your children's education, your retirement plan, or uh, a glitch in, um, in your business, or maybe uh, planning for that new car. A savings account uh, demonstrates that you are, uh, know how to plan your money. And then um, uh, finally, uh, the last thing about your personal finances, what do you need to cover six to 12 months of expenses? Because this business is not guaranteed to, uh, to, to go full speed from the day you open the door. So uh, how are you going to cover those expenses uh, in that six to 12 month period where your business ramps up to, uh, to being a, a viable income source? You need to know that. And all of these items that are on this list will, can be discussed with your lender uh, when they are trying to decide whether to give you a new loan or not. Um, so again, this is personal stuff. You need to be prepared to discuss that. Your bank is going to ask you for a personal financial statement, um, uh, even though you're going into a commercial situation. They want to know how strong you are. Okay, so let's talk uh, about your your options. Uh, the poll that the, that you took at the beginning of this uh, is an indicator uh, that. Most of you have made your decision about which way you're going to go. So let's just talk about a few of those. Okay. The first one is starting a new business. The advantage of starting a new business is that you're, uh, you're not hampered by uh, the previous businesses, uh, reputation, or the technologies that they use. Um, you can choose your own location, pick your name, your logo, build your own relationships with suppliers and, and um, uh, partners. Uh, you can explore new markets and directions. You're thinking out of the box. You're looking at uh, uh, who needs my product and maybe uh, I'm gonna go into an area that other people haven't thought about. The disadvantages of starting a new business is there are, you have no customer base. You're starting with zero. Uh, so how do I, uh, how do I find my, uh, my customers is the first, one of the first questions about starting a new business. You're taking a bigger risk. If you, if you were to buy a business, uh, you would already have customers. You'd already have a credit uh, history for the business, easier to get a loan. Um, so uh, having no track record, it's a little more difficult to get financing. In fact, a lot of banks won't talk to you until you have at least two years of uh, business operations. They feel like it's too risky. Um, but there are folks that specialize in new businesses, and we can talk about that when we get into uh, the financing uh, uh, webinar that uh, Teresa talked about earlier, okay? Another option is to buy an existing business. None of you are, are, are contemplating that, so I'm gonna skip over that. But um, um, 
you can see that uh, buying an existing business, you already have customers, suppliers, uh, but there are these hidden issues of stuff that the business owes that is not necessarily revealed in the beginning. Um, and uh, maybe the business has a bad reputation that you're not aware of. So you, uh, you're starting behind the eight ball, but none of you are uh, contemplating buying an existing business. Uh, so we don't have to deal with those particular issues. None of you are uh, considering buying a franchise, but at some point in time in the future, you may decide to make your business that you're starting now into a franchise. I mean, McDonald's started with one location and then uh, one of the owners decided, well, I can put this in a number of different, uh, different areas. And then later on, they decided, well, I don't have to manage all these. I can, uh, I can build this into a franchise and each owner will be responsible for their own business. Uh, so that's something you might consider uh, as you get down the road, uh, whether you want to franchise your business and sell your franchise uh, to uh, other uh, individuals. Okay. Home-based business. Several of you uh, indicated home-based business. What are the advantages? It's a convenient work location. You don't have to drive and find a parking space. In the cold weather, you, uh, um, you just close the curtains in the window. Um, so it's a convenient work location. And I can work anytime I want to. I can work at two o'clock in the morning. Um, and um, uh, so it's just there when I want to work on it. There's less overhead. I don't have to rent another space. Uh, I've got it covered with my, uh, my personal rent. Uh, flexible schedule. Um, when I work from home, I can decide what hours I'm going to do. I have no customers coming in uh, to my home. So I can, um, um, I can decide when I'm going to work. It has some tax advantages. Um, uh, you have to be careful about this, but let's say that the area of your office comprises 10% of the total square footage of your, uh, of your house or apartment. Uh, you can take that 10%, whatever percentage that is of the total space that you're renting, and take 10% of the lease cost, 10% of the heat, uh, electricity, uh, those kind of things, the general uh, expenses of operating that space, and you can deduct those. The problem is the IRS doesn't really like this because people abuse this, this piece a lot. When, uh, if you were to get audited and the IRS guy comes in to look at your office, it, it better look like an office. We don't wanna see your sewing and your kids' toys and your, your um, um, your hobby of, um, I don't know, growing plants or whatever, um, whatever your hobby might be, it needs to be specific workspace. Uh, it needs to contain only the work items that are related to your business. Uh, otherwise, uh, the IRS will disallow that, uh, that uh, deduction that you're taking uh, for your workspace. So work with your accountant uh, about what's, what can be in there and uh, but it is an advantage if you do it right. And then uh, uh, in a home-based business, you can hire people anywhere in the US or the world. Uh, people can work virtually for you um, and uh, um, no, uh, uh, no need to have uh, a space for employees to do their job uh, for a home-based business. Disadvantages, some towns uh, or cities will designate areas where businesses are not allowed. And it doesn't matter if customers are coming to your business or not. Uh, depending on the rules of the individual town, you may not be able to operate a, any kind of commercial uh, endeavor uh, out of your home. Don't forget, you're gonna have to list the uh, address of your business. And if that address um, uh, in your permit is in an area that is, um, that is blocked from running a commercial space, you won't be able to operate in your town. Uh, one of the other problems with a home-based business is that you're isolated from other people. One of the great things about working in an office space is that you get to share ideas and bounce ideas off other people. Well, if you're, if you're working from home, you don't have that opportunity. Uh, you're gonna have difficulty finding financing because there's nothing for a bank to repossess, just the, the, maybe the furniture in your computer. Uh, there's, there's no hard uh, uh, amount of uh, assets that they could, they could use to, uh, to guarantee your loan. And then there are family distractions. Uh, maybe you've got uh, children uh, they can be really uh, intrusive 
I, I happen to have a dog that uh, as she hears me talking, uh, she may come up and uh, nudge me. She wants to go out, she wants a treat. Um, she just wants attention. Uh, so those are, um, those are things that can intrude on your uh, business process. So home-based businesses are good, but they do have a downside. Uh, nonprofit, uh, nonprofits are okay. Uh, you have to be sure that you follow all the rules. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you could qualify for government or foundation grants. And a lot of people go to nonprofit because they, uh, they believe there's a lot of free money out there. Uh, the problem I have with grants um, is you may get the grant today, this year, but you're not guaranteed that same grant next year uh, because you're going to have competitors. Other folks are going to be competing for a finite amount of money uh, and you may not win it next year. So you can't, uh, you can't um, rely on that. This means that you either hire somebody for constant grant applications uh, or you, uh, you find a more sustainable way of main, uh, keeping your uh, nonprofit going. Grants are great. And you should have a budget for how much grants you're going to uh, you're going to want to get, but will that keep your business running? Uh, protection from liability for the director's employees. The law says that uh, uh, as a director of this, uh, the business can be sued, but I can't be uh, sued as a director. Okay, uh, and uh, other advantages: I can pay salaries to employees and consulting fees for contractors. Uh, I can be an employee of this nonprofit and get paid by the nonprofit. Disadvantage, um, you need to focus on uh, educational or charitable purposes. And you cannot, uh, the people who created this cannot get the profit from this. Like a, a for-profit business, if there's money in the, in the cash account, I can distribute that to myself. You can't do that with a nonprofit. All the money that comes into the no nonprofit needs to be spent on the purpose of the nonprofit. If you decide to close the nonprofit, you can't take that money out and use it for yourself. You have to spend it uh, according to what your charter was. All profits remain in the organization. There's no distribution of profits to investors or otherwise. And you have to apply for and qualify for the 501c3 uh, for a sales tax uh, uh, exemption. Okay. Online businesses. I think I, I think there was one or two of you that were looking at an online business. Great idea. Uh, I would say almost half of the, uh, the clients that I've talked to in the last six months are starting online businesses. Great. There's low startup costs. I don't have to rent a place. I don't have to get a truck. Uh, they're growing uh, consumer acceptance of this idea, especially after COVID. Shopping online has been so easy. I get delivery for things that I used to have to drive to pick up and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so consumers are not so turned off by shopping online now. Um, you get an expanded geographic reach. If I had a shop in downtown Springfield, Massachusetts, as an example, I could count on the geographic area of maybe Springfield and perhaps a few communities on the fringe of Springfield, but I'm not gonna get that guy from Boston He's not going to drive all the way out to Western Massachusetts to pick up a, a, a coffee cup that I'm selling. Uh, uh, but now as an online business, I can reach out to that guy in Boston or San Francisco and I can still sell my, uh, sell my products. Um, uh, online businesses are convenient and they're accessible for customers because they can shop 24 seven. You don't have to open the doors for anybody. It's all there all the time. And uh, you have flexibility uh, to do business anywhere uh, at any time. I can still my, run my business, even though I'm taking a vacation in Aruba. I can sign on and answer my emails. I can, I can sign on and um, um, accept, your, uh, accept your, your money. I can arrange for your delivery. I can run that business from anywhere in the world um, uh, because it's online. Disadvantages. Low barriers to entry. Oh, you've got, you, you've got your business all set up. It's a phenomenal business. You're like one of a kind. Uh, you're just feeling really, really good about your business. And I come in, I look at your website. I look at what's going on and I say, 
God, that's a great idea. I can do that too. So just like you had the lower startup cost, I can be in business in a couple of hours um, and compete with you. So there are low barriers to entry. So you're going to get a lot more competition. That means you need to do a much better job of communicating your message or providing a quality product, all of those things, a lot of pressure from uh, a lot more com uh, competitors. And then com consumers have a higher expectation uh, of the quality of your product. It comes to my house. I don't get a chance to touch it or test it when I'm buying online. It gets to my house and the darn thing is too small. Um, uh, an example, I, uh, uh, I was looking for a sewing kit. I've got a few things I need to sew. Uh, I don't, I'm not in it uh, to, to make a business out of it. So I go online, I go to Amazon and there's a ni nice little kit that's got like a, a dozen different colors of threads and uh, a range of needles and so forth. So I ordered it, it comes to the house and the darn thing is only like three inches by three inches. Uh, it's a lot smaller and uh, for my fingers, the needles don't work that well. So I had a higher expectation of what I was gonna get and uh, now that it's uh, this really small three by three, I can't even handle the spools. I'm not happy with what I got. They should have told me in the advertisement how small this darn thing was. Okay, so consumers are looking at your website and they have a higher expectation of your ability to deliver. And there's no personal contact. When I walk into your storefront, your brick and mortar storefront, and I'm looking around, um, you have a chance to say, uh, welcome to my shop, make me feel comfortable. Uh, and then, uh, I, what are you looking for? Oh, I, I, need to, um, I, I need to hammer a nail. Okay, well, come on over here. Here's our line of hammers. Some of them are for little tacks and some of them are bigger and so forth. And here's a pneumatic one over here. Uh, so I can point you uh, back and forth. And now if the customer has a problem with, uh, with, no, I don't think these things are quite right. In a brick and mortar situation, you're gonna say, well, I have these other things that might do the job just as well. Online, you don't get that possibility. You can't build the personal contact. Uh, you can't offer alternatives. Uh, you have uh, very little ways of uh, dealing with a customer's uh, um, reaction to, uh, to your product. Uh, so let's look at the components of owning a business. And it, it, it's not just about the ownership piece. It's uh, in a business now, you're the CEO of this, uh, of this business. Uh, when I was running a business, I had an administrative secretary. Guess what? You're the one that's setting up the appointments. You're the one that's typing the, the, um, um, the, the memos, the, uh, the letters and the uh, posting to the uh, whatever. Uh, so you have that uh, responsibility now, but you also have responsibility for accounting. How are you gonna deal with accounting in your company? You're gonna hire somebody? Uh, you're gonna uh, hire a company to do it? Whoops, uh, sorry about that again. Um, you're gonna hire a company to do it? Um, uh, are you gonna learn how to do it yourself? Human resources, hiring people, you're gonna do all the interviewing. Uh, you gotta advertise, where are you gonna advertise? What are you gonna advertise? That's you. Uh, and then we have marketing and sales. The difference between the two, marketing is getting people to come find you. Sales is actually uh, making the sales pitch and collecting the money. So how are you going to get people to know what's going on? Uh, are you going to do that? Or are you going to hire somebody, an individual to work for you as an employee uh, that's going to do your marketing? Or now there are a lot of marketing firms out there. Uh, you contract with them and they do your marketing for you. How about uh, sales? How are you going to handle your sales? In a brick and mortar, you've got to, uh, you've got to come up with a cash register uh, of some kind, uh, um, that kind of thing. On, uh, if it's online, you have to decide between PayPal and the, uh, Apple Pay and um, whatever um, collection uh, companies are out there. But you have to make that decision. And customer service. Every time I buy something on Amazon, the vendor sends me a little, I'm sure it's automated, but they send me a little note that says, how was the product? Is it everything that you expected? That's customer service. Are you gonna do that? How are you gonna do that? You're responsible for production, making sure that when I order that cup, I'm, uh, you're going to have that cup in stock, or you're gonna be able to get it to me within the promised delivery time. And then of course, there's technology. What kind of technology? Software, hardware that you're going to use to keep your business running. If you've got people in the field, um, uh, 
Uh, are they going to be, each one of them has a little iPad or they have a smartphone or how are they going to get their assignments and report their, their finishes? Uh, and what facilities are you going to use? Am I doing this in, in my house? Am I doing this in a storefront? Am I doing this in somebody renting an office from somebody? All of these things are you. And you need to uh, answer all of those questions before uh, you get into that banker and uh, or lender or talk to your mother about how you're going to spend the money that you're going to get and how's this business actually going to function. So uh, marketing. Marketing is the strategies that you use to create a desire to purchase your product. I like the example of the Kiwi. As I was growing up, uh, there were no Kiwis in stores. Uh, we didn't have Kiwis here in, in the US except maybe in a specialty store somewhere. So there's this guy down in, um, in uh, New Zealand uh, who has a big Kiwi farm and he looks up north there and he sees the United States and he says, I'd like to sell my Kiwis up there. So he gets up, to, uh, uh, up here to the US and trying to get people to accept a fruit that's a, that's a hairy, ugly looking thing and it's not like an apple. It's not like you take a big bite out of it. I don't know how to deal with this fruit because I've never seen it before. So what he did was uh, he went to the personal marketing. And just like we see uh, today, there's, he's out there holding a tray of sliced um, uh, kiwis. And he's trying to create a desire for people walking by. Why would you want to buy this ugly fruit? Well, look at this fruit. It has seven flavors in this fruit depending on, uh, on which part of the fruit that you're eating. The outer layers are three different uh, versions of citrus. It goes from an, uh, from an orange uh, to a lemon as you get closer to the center. And then of course, there's that little white center in the kiwi that tastes just like a banana. Uh, so I'm, I'm creating your, your desire to try a kiwi. Uh, and then I'm going to go to uh, the owner of the shop and say, you should stock my kiwis because my kiwis have a really long shelf life. Unlike that banana that you put out there, uh, my kiwi has a two month shelf life. So you can keep the same kiwi out there for two months without selling it. And it still is in good condition compared to that banana over there. Uh, so marketing creates and promotes your image and builds your brand. Maybe I put uh, uh, recipes out there that people can use that include of course my kiwi. Uh, and the thing to remember is that your product or service is not going to uh, sell itself. And that gets covered um, in uh, a marketing plan uh, workshop that would be coming up. A lot of details to marketing. Branding. Uh, when I, when I uh, talk uh, five interlocking rings, uh, you can think about the Olympics. You can think about the logo of uh, a car company. What about that, uh, the, um, let's call them the golden arches. Okay, you see it off in the distance. There are no words that I'm seeing there, but I can see those, uh, uh, those arches off in the distance. I know there's a hamburger under there. Uh, I know that the name of that business is McDonald's. That's called branding. All of the messages that you heard from the time you were a little kid, from the time that uh, somebody dragged you into a, uh, into a McDonald's and gave you a happy meal, uh, McDonald's was doing their branding. They wanted you to be, come to know their name, uh, recognize their name when you see those golden arches. Um, the implication of that brand is uh, what my product is used for. Uh, how is my product or service used? And then uh, it identifies me in a certain uh, industry or market. For instance, the golden arches tells me it's a restaurant, it's an eatery. Um, um, the other logos, the Olympic logo or the car logo, uh, I know right away which industry I'm talking about. There's no hamburger under those five rings, okay? Um, uh, and then uh, advertising. Um, advertising is an integral part to branding. Uh, the main thing is to get my name out there, get the recognition. Uh, that's why you see stuff on bull, uh, billboards or these days, uh, traveling billboards, the the thing on the side of the bus, the, uh, uh, we want to get your, your, your name and your recognition out there as much as, as, much as possible. Um, and um, then we have uh, sales. Uh, sales is where we're actually making the contact and connection with the customer. Uh, sales is where we uh, follow up on leads and find prospects. 
Uh, marketing gets me the leads, people express their interest, but it's up to somebody to go out there and actually make the sale. So um, uh, you may have to make a presentation. Um, sales uh, are the folks that, that, that do the PowerPoint and sit in front of the CEO and, and get the CEO to buy the classes that you're, uh, that you're trying to get, um, get them to buy. Uh, you might have to prepare a bid, which means you need to be aware of the cost and be able to build the cost of, um, uh, of your product. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot more to cost than just what you're presenting. If I'm only selling a workshop, for example, um, there is the stuff that leads up to building the workshop. I've got to have a, a computer. I've got to have uh, software to help me build it. Uh, what does that stuff cost? I'm sitting in my office. It's uh, a tenth of my, uh, my home. So I've got some lease uh, costs I have to uh, cover. I got electricity and, uh, and heating. What is my cost? Okay, I need to know that before I get into the bid. Uh, we here in Western Mass, we have a uh, one of our mentors specialized in uh, costing through her career, primarily uh, detailed costing uh, for construction projects. And she works with our clients to develop their true costs um, to uh, to be able to prepare a bid or set a set a sales price. Uh, you need to uh, uh, be able to prepare a bid. Uh, and then um, sales, uh, you have to be able to close the deal. Uh, there's a guy named Karras who wrote uh, books back in the back in the 70s, I believe. Uh, he, <clears throat> he says that the main uh, problem with selling is that people forget to ask for the sale. So you have to be able to close the deal. After I've made my prep uh, my presentation, whether it's in the elevator or in front of the CEO, I need to be able to say, um, Okay, so uh, how many of these do you want? Uh, you got to close the deal and make the, uh, the, uh, the sale happen. And then finally, we have to process the orders to be sure that uh, what I promised you I was going to deliver is actually uh, happening. It's being constructed. So uh, we need to get the order to the right place and into the schedule so the customer gets the product. <clears throat> uh, do you have the skills? Uh, are you weak in any of the areas of this uh, operation? Uh, uh, if so, how are you going to deal with that? You're going to hire somebody to do it. You're going to go out and take a course and learn it yourself. Uh, how are you going to deal with uh, any weakness that you have in uh, skills of operating your business? That's part of your planning process. How are you going to do that? Uh, can you hire somebody to take on uh, that responsibility or partner with somebody to do that other, that other part? Uh, even if you're skilled in all roles, you don't have time to do this. You don't have time to do all the accounting if you're going to be also cooking for your restaurant, as an example. Um, so how are you going to get it done? Uh, and then one of the, some of the questions that you ask yourself about your product or service, who needs it? Uh, we talk a lot about, um, uh, with my clients, I use a business model canvas. And that's all about uh, who the client is, what their problems are, and how you're going to see, uh, solve that. Your mentor can work you through that process of identifying who needs your product. And that goes back to the description of your product and the function of your product to figure out what pain you're, uh, you're resolving. Why do they need your product? We need to know that. Why? Um, uh, and how is it different or better than your competition? Why would I buy that cup from you instead of from the guy across the street? What does your cup do? Uh, I had a, uh, a client who uh, had uh, a little LED screen on the outside of the coffee cup and it had a motivational message that would change on a, on a regular basis. So you get up in the morning and you pour your cup of coffee and it says, have a great day. Um, uh, who would buy that? Uh, we have to figure out whether that product is worth it or not. And then uh, another critical factor is um, location, okay? We can talk about location under several different uh, definitions. First, which market am I in? Um, we, uh, how does your product fit the general mass or is there a small group of people that we're, that we're actually uh, working with? Um, uh, niche markets, you get to charge a little extra for it. Uh, I'm reminded of a, of a client who sells a smoke detector. Uh, well, you can buy a smoke detector for, let's say, $10 or $15 almost everywhere. Um, Target, Walmart, um, Home Depot, whatever. She sells hers for uh, $200, $250. Bucks. 
but her uh, her product uh, is serving a niche market. The niche is uh, mentally challenged individuals trying to live alone who have a caregiver. Uh, and when the smoke detector goes off, in the caregiver's voice, it says, Johnny, the smoke detector just went off. You need to go outside and uh, wait by the tree where we practiced. And then the smoke detector uh, calls the caregiver and says, the smoke detector just went off uh, and Johnny was directed to go back out by the tree. So not everybody wants to pay 250 bucks for a smoke detector, but if you're caring for somebody in a remote location that's not your home, maybe you want to know uh, that the smoke detector went off. So maybe it's worth it to you. So the niche market, what market are you in? What are you targeting? And then the competition. Uh, one of the things I like to say is a flower shop does not sell flowers, okay? A flower shop says, uh, gives you a way, gives the customer a way to express their sentiment. I'm sorry, your uncle Joe died. Congratulations on your anniversary. Go to the prom with me. Uh, but there are other ways to, uh, to do, do this recognition. For instance, I could buy candy um, uh, as a way of saying, this is how I feel about you. I could buy you a gift certificate to go to the theater or for a restaurant uh, night out. So your competition is not just other flower shops. It's uh, folks who have, uh, can accomplish the same thing that your flowers do. Okay? So uh, uh, we'll talk about competition in a while here. Uh, distribution. How do I get the product to you? Um, uh, do you come to me? Do I, uh, do I sell it to another shop who sells it to you? Do I send it to you through the mail? Uh, do I deliver it in person? Do I install it in person? Um, and then merchandising. Merchandising is uh, the packaging that, that goes with it, um, the outside uh, box that you put the cup in. Um, merchandising is the, um, the pirate or the clown on the cereal uh, as you walk down the cereal aisle. That's uh, developing the appeal, but also its location of the of the merchandise. If you look in, uh, you go into uh, Walmart, you see different things at different times on the end caps. That's part of merchandising. Uh, the, the people who are supplying those products pay Walmart for that space at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the aisle. It's part of the merchandising, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. That's part of the problem of working from home is you get the uh, the barking dog in the background. Sorry about that. Good example though. Um, and then uh, other critical factors: price. Price is the first uh, uh, the first indicator to a customer of the value of your product. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so if I have two cups here, a three dollar cup and a ten dollar cup, your assumption is that the ten dollar cup is worth more uh, than the three dollar cup. Okay, so it's the first impression of value. Um, price is dependent upon the cost. Uh, you have to figure out what it really costs me to get that cup to the customer before I can set the price of what I want you to pay. And who's competing with me for cups or, or, or mugs or whatever, uh, whatever my competition is? Who's competing? And what are they charging? I need to be able to, uh, to figure out um, whether I'm going to be the price leader, the price follower, or the low price in the marketplace. Uh, but in, to, in order to do that, I, know what the, I need to know what the customer or the competitor is uh, charging. And then uh, uh, credit terms available as part of the sales uh, pitch. Uh, I recommend that uh, no, no new business should offer credit terms uh, because your, your cash is, uh, is very critical, especially in the early days. And uh, we don't want other people using your cash, your money, um, uh, when you need it uh, more critically uh, in your business. Um, um, sorry. Don't ask me how that happened. Okay. Uh, assessing your competitors. How big, is, how big is your competitor and how many employees do they have? That gives you an indication of what you're competing against. What kind of price do they have? Uh, are they leaders, followers, or the low price in the marketplace? And what's the quality of their product? Uh, can you beat their quality um, for the price that you want to sell it? Uh, what is it? Uh, you need to know what your competitors are producing. What services do they provide? Uh, as an example, um, 
Home Depot uh, is uh, competing uh, by saying that they will assemble that grill for you uh, if you want to. Uh, you don't have to take it home in a box and figure out the diagram to put it together. I've got experienced people here who will put the grill together. I might even deliver it for you. What kind of services do you provide for your product? Uh, what's the reputation of your, uh, of your competitors? Uh, are they, um, do people think they're a really great place to shop? Are they frustrated? Uh, what are their strengths and weaknesses? Uh, a good example, I walk into Home Depot, I wanna buy, I wanna buy a hammer. Where the hell are the hammers? I don't know where they are. I walk into a little, uh, little store, Ace Hardware across the street or mom and pop. Um, and I say uh, to, the, to the folks that greet me at the door, where are your hammers? And they point me right over there, sir. I'll, have, I'll be over to help you in a minute. Big box stores can't do that. I can beat them on service. Uh, so I, I know what their strengths and their weaknesses are. Uh, how do I find out these things? I go and visit them. I visit their websites. Uh, I might buy a product from them and see how they, uh, how they handle returns or whatever. I look at the other customers. Are they, uh, are they getting what they want? Personal visits and observations of your competition are really uh, important. Who are their suppliers? And what do other businesses in the, uh, in the area think about them? Uh, and then uh, making it uh, legal. Let's, let's stop for a minute. Are, are there, um, uh, do we have any uh, questions? Yeah, there hasn't been any um, questions posted. Um, certainly, if somebody wants to do hit the raise um, hand icon real quick, we can, we can allow you to ask that question out loud if you'd like, or if you want to get a question typed in, uh, we can get that answered here shortly, too. We're tossing a lot of information out there. If you uh, develop a question in the process, feel free to hit your uh, raise hand and we'll, uh, we'll stop for a second and address your, uh, your questions. Um, uh, to be succinct, this is actually usually a three hour um, presentation. Uh, so there's a lot of information in it and uh, uh, we, we are recording it. So you get a chance to see it afterwards if, if you didn't get everything in your notes. Uh, and there are successive um, uh, workshops to go with this. And uh, we'll talk about, again, I wanna emphasize that you can get a score mentor to help you with these issues or the questions that you have. Okay, making it legal. Some options that you have, a sole proprietor. Uh, probably 80% of the clients that we have start off as a sole proprietor. Uh, it's the easiest thing to start. You go to the town, you, uh, uh, you ask them for a, a license or whatever their terminology is in the town. And you're basically going to set up a DBA, doing business as. So that's your name, doing business as the name of your company. They're going to ask you for your um, mailing address and uh, uh, who the owners are and uh, that sort of thing. Then there's a partnership. That's like two sole proprietors shaking hands and uh, doing business together. Um, so a partnership, uh, both of these are done on your uh, individual tax re return, your 1040. Uh, on what's called a Schedule C. Um, so uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you do it uh, in a partnership, uh, you decide in the beginning in your partnership agreement that um, you're gonna get 60% of, uh, of the business and the other person has 40%. That means on your Schedule C, you're gonna look at the total sales and take 60% of that on yours. And the other person is gonna take 40% on their Schedule C. The same with all the expenses all the way down. So you get taxed on 60% of uh, what the business does and the other person will get taxed on 40% of what the business does. Um, then we come to a limited liability company and that's just that. By forming an, an LLC, uh, if somebody sues the business, uh, they can't take your, your kid's scholarship fund, they can't take your savings account, they can't take your house, they're limited to the, uh, their liability is limited to what you've identified as company assets. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, I think in the state of Massachusetts, it costs about $500 for the state. And I think um, a lawyer to set it up is about 200 bucks or something of that nature. You can do it online in legal Zoom, but um, I have a personal fixation about that. I believe that something as important as the structure of my company I want to be able to go into that lawyer's office and slap my hand down on the desk and say, you screwed up, fix it. 
Uh, otherwise, it's me that screwed up and I got to slap myself in the face. Uh, uh, I prefer to deal with professionals when it comes to something that's critical. You have your own uh, uh, opinion about that. And then we have the S Corporation. S Corporation is, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a kind of uh, a baby uh, corporation, if you will. Um, it's not as all inclusive. Uh, profits are only taxed at the uh, shareholder level. Uh, in other words, it's not on your Schedule C. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the downside of, a, uh, of a, an S Corp is that it's limited to 100 shareholders. Uh, like any corporation, it can sell shares, but uh, only 100 shares. Um, and the shareholders can be uh, individuals. Um, and they can include uh, partnerships or uh, corporations. Uh, they can't buy your stock. And a non-resident alien uh, cannot be a shareholder. In other words, somebody from Puerto Rico can't, uh, Puerto Rico, sorry, bad choice. Somebody from uh, China can't come in and buy a, uh, buy a share from you uh, and uh, be a shareholder in your company. So there are some limitations there. So what do we recommend? Keep it simple. In the beginning, uh, until you have liability, you can uh, operate as a sole proprietor. It's very easy to upgrade to an LLC once you have a uh, liability a situation where folks might actually sue you. And again, these are conversations for your accountant and your lawyer uh, about the structure that you use to, uh, to set it up. Again, about 80% of our clients start as a sole proprietor. Um, government regulations you need to be, uh, you need to be aware of. Uh, you need a business license and whatever approvals uh, locally or statewide. Um, you need to be sure you've got those covered. Uh, labor laws. Uh, how many hours can you ask a worker to work? Uh, how old, for instance, if you, uh, can you hire a 16-year-old to do certain things in your business? What can they do? How many hours can they do it? Um, can they do it on uh, school days? Each community has their own uh, local regulations, but then there are also uh, state and federal regulations about uh, labor laws. And then immigration. Immigration is a big uh, topic for conversation here. If an immigrant uh, uh, applies to you and doesn't identify themselves as, uh, as uh, an illegal alien, let's say, um, you, uh, you hire them, uh, somebody comes in and audits your business, finds out that this, uh, this person is working on your payroll, they get deported or penalized, but you also get to pay a fine uh, because you didn't check out or verify the, uh, the work status. If you're asking for social security, for instance, every time you bring somebody on board, you might ask for their uh, social security um, for your payroll uh, information. Uh, an illegal uh, alien is not gonna have a social security number. Now this also works for students. Students who come into the, into the country to uh, attend college are on a student visa. That uh, means that they're not uh, allowed to work unless they get a, uh, a work visa as well or some, uh, I don't know, all that up on immigration law, but you can't uh, hire them if they're not allowed to work in this country. It's your responsibility. So you need to figure that out. And then there are IRS and social security withholding payments. How do I do it? How much do I withhold and so forth? These two guys, the, the IRS and Social Security are really picky about you actually sending them the money that you've withheld from your employees' checks. So you need to, uh, you need to be sure you know how to do that and do it correctly. And then we have uh, insurance, all kinds of different insurances you could buy. My uh, grandfather used to say that uh, uh, you could get insurance poor, which means you got too much insurance uh, to cover uh, things that are never going to happen to you. But you've got property insurance, liability insurance. Everybody knows that you have to have motor vehicle insurance, especially in the state of Massachusetts. And all the uh, three of these uh, have limits. In other words, when you get property uh, insurance on your home, it's insured up to $300,000. Um, and um, and uh, when you have liability insurance, somebody slips on your sidewalk, you're limited to $100,000 in your policy. And then motor vehicles, uh, uh, if you have the minimum, you're limited to maybe 15 or $25,000. Umbrella insurance, 
will take those policies and carry them beyond the limits. In other words, uh, uh, for um, uh, liability insurance, I've got 25,000 liability insurance, but uh, somebody comes in, they sue me for $100,000. I can have an umbrella liability insurance that covers me up to a, a million dollars. Uh, and when the original insurance leaves off, the umbrella insurance takes over, okay? Usually, um, most people don't get to that because they, uh, they made the decision that they don't need that. Workers' compensation. If you have an employee, you got to have workers' compensation. Um, and it, the price of that varies depending on the industry you're working with. Uh, somebody who's installing uh, things on a light pole is going to have more liability than somebody who hires a receptionist to answer the telephone. So the insurance uh, will be a different price for each of those. And then there's health insurance in the state of Massachusetts. If you've got, um, if you've got uh, above, I think it's 15 employees, you have to provide uh, health insurance for them. Life insurance is one of those benefits that uh, is easy to produce because it's very low cost for the, uh, for the company to uh, provide, but it's one of those options that you could decide to, uh, to uh, purchase. And then there's business interruption insurance. If something unnatural happens, or uh, let's say we had a, a tornado in downtown Springfield a few years back, the um, business uh, interruption insurance uh, could kick in uh, for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, that situation. Um, sorry. Uh, so what, what we're doing at this point now, we've got all this stuff that we've been thinking about back here. And you may have a spreadsheet for each of those line items that we talked about, um, but we got to put it together now into a business plan. Why a business plan? How, why would anybody want to create a business plan? Well, it encourages an objective view. Each of you has a picture of your business in your head. You know exactly how you're going to do that. So how am I going to present that idea to, uh, to a lender or even to a partner or uh, to an employee, I want them to understand what my business does. Or for you, uh, three months down the road, what did you expect to accomplish by April 15th? Um, by putting it down, uh, I have an objective view of where I need to be. It becomes the foundation for your planning. This is my basic business. Okay, I'm thinking about adding a new product. What is that going to do to my basic business? Is, do I need more employees? Uh, do I have space to store the inventory? What about marketing? Is my marketing going to be different? How about delivery? It becomes a foundation for planning on whether or not you can add products, you can hire an employee, whether you want to open a new location. It gives you a chance to, uh, uh, to figure out how uh, different options that come up are going to impact on your business. It's a great management tool. You're going to be creating, uh, when you do your business plan, you're going to be creating a, a forecasted uh, income statement month by month. Now, when you're at the end of each actual month, you go into your QuickBooks or your accountant, and they come out with an income statement for the month. You can take that and put it up against your plan, what I plan to do in January, and you can see where it's different. Oh, sales were down in this product category. I forecasted it here. It was there. Why? Now you become a detective, and all of those things that are different from where you uh, forecasted it you get an indication, this is an area I need to examine. This is where I need to go to figure out how to avoid that problem in the future. Or if I exceeded something, uh, maybe I got, uh, I got more sales for this product line. Okay, why? Because I need to know that because I wanna do that again. I wanna exceed sales uh, next month as well. So uh, what happened? So now I'm gonna go down through and compare actual to to my forecast, and I have an idea of how I can manage this uh, situation to be more positive for me. So it's a great management tool, and it communicates your ideas. You can talk to the, uh, you can take it to your lender, you can show your employees, you can set up, uh, once you set your target for how many sales for the month, it can be like that uh, United Way thermometer. Uh, uh, everybody in the company knows that you, that you need to make $10,000 in sales. So as the sales come in, you kind of keep everybody informed and you watch that needle yourself. You can uh, keep track of, uh, of what you're trying to accomplish. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the business plan can be uh, very powerful. And as I mentioned, 
uh, planning is the number one reason that businesses fail and score through the, the business planning tools and your mentor are trying to put you on the plus side of that statistic. Okay, we don't want you to fail. We're gonna help you avoid that first primary reason for business to fail by helping you develop a really solid, good functional business plan. Um, if you don't get it from SCORE, there are a number of other organizations that do it. Planning is the important part of that. Uh, what's in a business plan? Of course, we have a table of contents. We think of the business plan as a story of your company. What is, uh, uh, so the business plan is gonna, um, like a novel is gonna include a table of contents. The executive, darn, why does it do that? Um, sorry about that. Um, the executive summary of the business plan is written at, uh, at the end when you finished all of your planning, uh, uh, all of your planning documents. It's a summary, like the first chapter of a book. If I like the first chapter, I'm going to go on and read the read the rest of the book. If I don't like it, uh, I'm putting the book down. You'll never get your idea across. Uh, so section one is a narrative that describes the business, what the business is going to do. Uh, section two uh, are the financial aspects, all the uh, forecasts uh, for uh, sales and payroll and expenses and all of that. Uh, section three is supporting data. Nice to have. Uh, if you're doing a restaurant, uh, I can put my menu in there. It's stuff I don't really need, but it's stuff that's informational in case I'm sitting in front of a, a loan officer and they say, well, what, are, what kind of dishes are you going to offer? Oh, okay, it's not important to, to the uh, process of lending me money, but uh, it's informational. Okay, uh, every business owner needs to have a relationship with a banker, uh, a lawyer, an accountant, an insurance agent, and business mentor. These are people you trust, people who know you, and people who want to, uh, who want to help you. Uh, so you need to have a relationship with these folks. That doesn't mean they need to be on your payroll. It does mean that you can call them when you have a problem. Uh, one of the things that you're gonna find, and I'll tell you in a minute where to find it, is uh, small business ready, readiness self-assessment, okay? Um, it, is your idea feasible? Um, um, who, are your, uh, who are your customers? What market are you in? Uh, how do I get started with um, uh, starting this thing? How, where am I going to find the money? And am I actually ready to do this? Uh, you're going to find this at this website. Uh, this is a website that covers uh, a series of, uh, of uh, individual uh, workshops. Uh, Score.org slash start your business. It includes that form that I just showed you and other forms. Uh, that you can use uh, to help with your business. It includes uh, links to articles or tools that you can use. Um, so I encourage you to, um, uh, to check that out. Uh, we are, this, uh, this workshop is the first one in that series. Okay. Now, when, you, when it comes to uh, getting your mentor, these, uh, these folks, uh, these different uh, locations can give you a hand trying to uh, connect with a mentor. Uh, you can put, uh, if you want a mentor, somebody to help you with this, you can um, put, your, uh, put your name and contact information, your email address into the chat, and we'll follow up with that later and uh, connect you with one of, these, one of these chapters who might be nearest to you. It would help if you put your zip code in there uh, so we can help you get somebody who's close to you. And with that, <clears throat> we finished the... Um, our presentation for today. I'm I'm sorry it was so fast. We had uh, a lot of uh, a lot of information to get through. Um, so, um, anybody have a comment or a question? Uh, something we can we can answer at this time. Uh, we did have a comment about the link. Uh, I wanted to see if I can get make sure we got that one right. Um, I'm gonna work on that for a second. The score.org start your business. Let me go back to that. Let me see if I put that in wrong or not. Mm.
Uh, Lauren says that the, that link is broken. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Um, Give me a second, let me see. I'm trying to find the correct. I think I might have it for you. Let's see. Okay. I can, yeah. while you're doing that, I can read down through your, how do you figure out all your costs to operate? There's a number of different ways of uh, figuring out what your costs are. Um, you can Google um, sample um, um, income statement for flower shop. Um, and you'll, you'll find uh, a website that will show you comparisons of different um, um, types of flower shops or whatever, or garden centers or whatever. Uh, uh, so find a sample of that, um, um, of that uh, type of business and uh, you can compare what, uh, what costs, et cetera, that you should, what line items you should be including in your, uh, in your cost. The other way is to visit one of the, one of the, the businesses. I had a, a client who was starting a, uh, um, a garden uh, uh, center, uh, and he traveled around to visit as many garden centers as he could find. He found somebody in New York that was an older couple thinking about retiring. Uh, they struck up a really great um, friendship, and uh, they became his business mentor, meaning that they had experience in his business, and uh, he was able to get a lot of information from them about this kind of thing. Uh, often we can find a, uh, a mentor who has a uh, experience in your, uh, in your industry, uh, in your process. And if we can't find them in our chapter, we can search them out across the country because SCORE has uh, over 10,000 uh, volunteers and all different kinds of industries and backgrounds. So we can check that out for you and, and uh, your mentor can help you uh, estimate that. Um, can you please talk a little bit about a new business a lease and how to negotiate terms? Uh, lease in terms of, I'm assuming that's a lease for a, um, um, uh, a space of some kind. I, but I, it, it, it works regardless of whether you're talking about space or project uh, products or, um, or suppliers. Uh, when you approach, when you approach um, negotiations for a lease, um, you need to know what you want out of the lease before you step in there. And then uh, I like dealing with uh, somebody who can advocate on my behalf because they tend to be very objective about it. And they, uh, somebody who has experience in negotiating uh, particular leases can be very helpful. This could be your, your accountant, it could be your lawyer, it could be somebody um, that just does this as a business. Um, I would have to probably understand a little more about your, uh, your business um to um to really answer that so if you were my client uh, we would be sitting down and discussing that whole process and i'd bring in some other resources uh, somebody asked about uh if there's a second session um so yeah there's a couple different options for you on that there's the simple steps um though that um len does um and that's broken into um parts like this one is uh he'll do be business concept marketing plan financial matters um or there's also the business foundation series where it takes each topic and goes into detail on those. I really strongly suggest that you um, either get on our newsletter, that's the best way to find out uh, what we have going on or to go to the chapter websites. You can either go to the Western Massachusetts website or you can go to the Boston website um, and you'll see listings of uh, all, all those topics of what's coming up. So that's, that would be that, uh, how, here's another question. How can you estimate your estimated, your expected sales? Ah, uh, uh, I'm a little unconventional in that area. Um, your business is your dream. What do you expect to accomplish in your business? So let's say, um, um, you estimate that as of December 31, 2023, I want to have $100,000 in sales. Um, we're going to build our business plan based on the $100,000 that you want to sell. Uh, and then the question becomes not how much, uh, can I, how much can I sell in December, 
It's how much will I sell in December? And then I develop my marketing and actions to uh, generate the 25 customers that I need for December. So I, I, my, my personal approach is more proactive. What do you wanna do? And then let's see what it takes to make it happen. When I build my business plan um, uh, based on the 100,000 I wanna accomplish, and I finish with that, I come to the conclusion, I can't find enough people to do that. So now I've got to scale my plan down to $80,000 uh, and then my um, how many customers I need to get each month to fill that um, is what I, can, uh, what I can accomplish through my actions. A lot of people look at this as, um, okay, I'm going to build the business plan. It's this concept of build it and they will come. Uh-uh. You build it and then you make it happen. So uh, how much are you going to sell in December? We need to figure out what's the potential for uh, sales in the area. What's the market for your product? Um, again, this is something you can work out with your mentor and different mentors take different approaches. Um, uh, but um, if you were my client, that's where we would start. Okay, Len, I've got a great question. What do you do first? Do you rent an office with your personal card, then create your business or your company? Or do you create the company first and then rent the office with your business card? Well, one of the things that, uh, that you do when you start your business plan is to accumulate everything you've already spent on the business. I already bought a computer. Um, uh, I already re uh, leased an office. Uh, the big question in here is going to be um, whether... Uh, um, the owner that you're, that you're renting the, the, the office from is going to accept a, a personal thing and you're going to warn him, I'm going to change this to a business. Will he cooperate with that or not? Um, from, my, from my standpoint, I need to develop some customers. So maybe I go to a low cost area and you see this all the time. A business starts out in a small space and moves to a larger space. So um, if you can afford to get the, the workspace up front, is it going to provide you income would be the question I would ask. Or uh, 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 you're going to be paying that out of pocket or you're going to ask the business to pay for it. I wouldn't rent a space myself uh, until I had uh, my, uh, my business all together. Um, your, uh, when you go for your license um, in the town, at that point in time, they're going to ask you what's the address of your business. Uh, so in that sense, just before you uh, pull the trigger, uh, you need to sign that lease. So when you get your permits, they all have the right address on it. Okay. Um, for a sole proprietorship, is a general liability and aggregate insurance needed? Uh, I saw that question. I'm not sure what aggr uh, aggregate uh, means, but uh, uh, for a sole proprietor, it's not about you particularly. It's more about the liability that your product creates. Uh, if you're uh, if you're providing a workshop and that's your business, how can I mess up your life with uh, with a workshop? Well, I can give you bad information, in which case you would turn around and sue me because uh, what I told you to do put you in a, a bad space. What's the what's the possibility of that when I'm talking about introducing you to social media? OK, so it's all about the liability that you and your product create. Um, um, if you if you're not in a, a high liability area, I wouldn't worry about uh, how much about a lot of insurance. I'd have a liability, but uh, I don't need a, a million dollars or six different policies or whatever. Depends on the business you're in and the liability that you set, that you you and your product set up. Okay, um, there is a question about a business plan and plagiarism. I'm not really sure what that one's about. Um, I, I would suggest potentially maybe you do the raise hand and we unmute you and allow you to ask that out loud um, and might make it clearer, or perhaps um, you might want to reach out and work with a mentor or talk to a mentor and ask that question. I'm not really sure what that one means, but uh, we do have another question. Uh, should my business plan include info for expansion in the event things go better than expected? Uh, when I worked for uh, a large company and we did our business plan each year, we would have to provide three business plans. We had uh, the best case, which says that everything works really great and it's a, a phenomenal situation. Uh, normal, which is what I would normally expect to happen. And a worst case uh, business plan. Okay. Uh, 
uh, if everything failed or this failed or 80% of the business uh, failed, uh, what would my business plan look like? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, that's way too complicated for some uh, small businesses, but it depends on your investment. If you've got a big investment in here, you might want to do an alternate business plan. Uh, I don't, I haven't found a need for that in the clients that, that I've worked with. Uh, but what the business plan does is give you that baseline. So, uh, and we have a tool that, uh, um, that does that. Um, it's the uh, 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 financial projection spreadsheet. When you find it on score.org, you can put that in the, um, in the search box, financial projections uh, template. Okay. Uh, you fill out the, the, the detailed costs and you get your P&L and your cash flow and your balance sheet and your break even point automatically calculated for you. Then I can go back and play games like what if I add one more, uh, uh, one more employee? I go back to the payroll page, add another employee. It blows all the way through automatically. Now I can go in and look at my financials, uh, my uh, income statement. What did adding an employee do to the bottom line? Oh, I got to add more sales. So I go back into the sales section, add some sales on it. Now I can see how much sales I need to offset the, the hiring of that employee. So rather than doing a whole other separate business plan, uh, I do one plan, freeze it, and then use a second copy to play games with. Um, what would happen if um, that, that's kind of uh, my approach to it. But you can do a, a whole separate plan. I just think it's a lot of extra work. Okay, we don't see any other new questions. So I guess if we want to do closing comments. Uh, yeah, uh, let me uh, let me stop sharing on the screen. Okay. Uh, all right. The the main thing that I want to that I want to emphasize uh, here is that uh, you all come to this with a with a dream. You you want to. Uh, open a business. Why? There's a reason why you want to open it. I want to be independent. I want to be able to make extra money. Uh, I want to. Uh, I want to have something I can leave to the kids. Uh, whatever. Um, this is a dream. If the dream is going to happen, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to make it happen. Uh, it's not going to happen when you just open the doors to a restaurant. You've got to do, as I mentioned before, you got to do something more than uh, uh, praying that they will come. There's a lot of work involved with, uh, with being an entrepreneur. Uh, there are a lot of resources out there that are, uh, that are available to help you. You've got to ask for them. Uh, a SCORE mentor is not only working with SCORE resources, but we can point you to other organizations that also can help in different, uh, in different ways, whether we're talking about the uh, uh, Massachusetts uh, Small Business Development Center, uh, there is uh, an or a sister organization of SCORE that uh, concentrates on uh, uh, women-owned businesses. Um, there are uh, veterans resources on the Small Business Administration website. And your SCORE mentor should be able to pull those resources together for you when you need them. And I suggest that uh, you should get a, a SCORE mentor if you don't have one. Um, in any case, uh, I'm glad that you came today. If you have any other questions, um, uh, get back to us, send us an email, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and if you need a, a mentor, we'll connect you with one of those chapters that, uh, that we put in there. Score.org, main site, uh, lots of resources, lots of workshops, lots of templates and articles, uh, a lot of things that can help you with your business score.org, explore it. On the upper left-hand corner, you put in a zip code, which is your zip code, and it'll give you the local chapter address um, where you can connect the local chapter, brings you to their website. So thank you again for, uh, for coming today. Um, I hope that we were able to help you in some, uh, in some way, and we look forward to seeing you again at one of our upcoming, uh, upcoming workshops. And I think that will do us for today. Thanks, Len. Take care, everybody. Have a good day.